Now, the head of the Wagner Group has released his first statement since the group's armed mutiny on June 24th. In an 11-minute audio recording that was just released, Prigozhin explained that Wagner was bound to cease to exist on July 1st. And he says that the goal of the march was to prevent the eradication of Wagner and to, quote, ensure that those who made a huge amount of mistakes during the special military operation be held responsible. Let's go to Yulia Shapovalova in Moscow. Yulia, bring, bring us up to speed. 11 minutes, there was time for Evgeny Prigozhin to say a lot in that audio recording. Exactly. I just have to take my time to listen at all. Uh, well, the latest reports uh, are saying that Prigozhin actually has been seen in Minsk, Belarus. And uh, basically what he uh, is saying is that uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense wanted to disband the Wagner Group, but uh, their purpose was not to capture uh, the power in Russia. So uh, basically their uh, goal, their purpose of their campaign, of their money, March was to uh, prevent the um, uh, destruction, uh, disbandment of the Wagner Group, and that uh, uh, those uh, individuals who actually wanted to, to do that, they will be held accountable. And uh, obviously, he continues blaming the Russian Ministry of Defense for all the mistakes they, uh, they committed. And uh, uh, basically, uh, what we hear and see is developing very quickly, because earlier on, we were talking about business and, as usual, and mm. we're talking about uh, the Russian authorities who are getting back to to business on Monday, and uh, Vladimir Putin was uh, speaking on the phone with uh, his Iranian uh, counterpart, with the Iranian president and uh, Emir of Qatar, and both leaders expressed their support to Russia and its uh, leadership, uh, condemning the mutiny um, conducted by the uh, Wagner chief. And uh, uh, Putin and his Iranian counterpart also discussed issues like ensuring stability in the Trans-Caucasus uh, region and the Syrian settlement, uh, while Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov gave his assessment on the rebellion, calling it unsuccessful and saying that the Russian special services uh, are now investigating whether uh, the Western intelligence services were involved in the events on Saturday. All right. This audio statement by Prigozhin is yet another remarkable development in everything that's been happening really since Friday evening. Um, Yulia, what are ordinary Russians saying about this? Are they talking about it? And if so, what are they saying about this? Well, actually, they are talking. Uh, ordinary Russians are also involved in their everyday activities. Many were following the recent developments and got quite concerned, to be honest. But uh, if you delve into the Russian social media sources and Telegram channels here, an interesting piece of news uh, comes into forefront. It's been um, it's been a uh, basically, Mr. Mr. Shoigu's first public appearance since Evgeny Prigozhin's march on a number of Russian cities a few days ago. The video uh, shows Shoigu remaining in his post and doing his business on the front line in the Lugansk region. And it's quite significant because, significant because um, well, recently there were many speculations that Shoigu could be replaced. Uh, there are many opponents of him, and many have admitted numerous mistakes in the army's management and uh, severely criticized uh, its leadership. But uh, Russia's president has been reluctant to change the Minister of Defense in order to not to admit all those mistakes. Uh, and now, after the rebellion, things have changed, according to official reports during the uh, Wagner march. At least two regular, uh, well, at least two army helicopters and a plane were shot down by Wagner, and obviously a number of pilots died. So now many ask who will be responsible for the loss of all those people and equipment. And, uh, well, again, it become a formal, formal pretext now to, to make a big decision now and uh, probably change um, the Minister of Defense. And uh, just uh, a short while ago, at least four pro-war Telegram channels with more than 7 million subscribers published reports that the governor of the Tula region, Alexei Duman, could replace Sergei Shoigu as a defense minister shortly. Once again, it's not official information, but it's spreading very quickly here. Uh, 
Duman is the former head of Putin's security, and for a short time he was deputy minister of defense and then became the governor of the Tula region. And during the Prigozhin rebellion, there was information that Alexei Duman participated in negotiations with the head of the Wagner group, but the uh, Tula regional authorities denied that. So experts say any change in the leadership of the Russian Ministry of Defense would mean a significant victory for Prigozhin, who launched his rebellion blaming Shoigu and the head of the Russian general staff Gerasima for the deaths of tens of thousands of Russian soldiers in Ukraine. So we're monitoring uh, all the developments here, and of course we are about to listen to the whole that uh, longer, very longer audio by Mr. Prigozhin. Absolutely. Yulia Shapovalova, thank you very much for your reporting there from Moscow. Now, Russian state media say that the head of the Wagner mercenary group, Prigozhin, is still under criminal investigation. However, the foreign minister says that his rebellious mercenary group will still remain active in countries including Mali and the Central African Republic. Rory Challenge reports. Crisis? What crisis? After the drama and chaos of the weekend, this is Russia's political and military leadership trying to show that everything is fine. Vladimir Putin speaking to an industrial forum and the first footage of the defence minister released since Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin called for his sacking and launched a short-lived mutiny briefly advancing on Moscow. Though we don't know when it was filmed, the message is clear. It's the Kremlin saying no mercenary leader can force Vladimir Putin to do anything. At a government meeting, Prime Minister Mishushtin urged Russians to unify. We need to act together as one team and maintain the unity of all our forces rallying around the president. We need to take calculated, unified decisions to effectively achieve goals set by the leader of the state. But for observers in the West, the events are signs that Russia's war in Ukraine has exposed deep fissures in the Russian president's hold on power. The monster that Putin created with the banner, the monster is biting him now. The monster is acting against his creator. The political system is in showing the fragilities and the military power is, is cracking. So this is an important consequence of the war in Ukraine. China is concerned by the possibility of a chaotic state collapse in its strategic partner, Russia. But the foreign ministry is saying little beyond general words of support. The incident of Wagner Group you mentioned is Russia's internal affair. As Russia's friendly neighbor and comprehensive strategic partner of coordination for the new era, China supports Russia in maintaining national stability and achieving development and prosperity. Yevgeny Prigozhin is supposedly headed for Belarus in the deal brokered by Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. Prigozhin was initially understood to have had mutiny charges against him in Russia dropped, but some Russian media are reporting the Wagner boss remains under investigation. Rory Challens, Al Jazeera. Uh, foreign ministers of the European Union have been discussing the situation in Russia and everything that transpired. Dominic Kane is live for us in Berlin. Dominic, how are European powers? I should mention, of course, the NATO Secretary General has also been talking about this. How are they all actually handling this? I mean, other than saying the obvious that there are cracks in the Russian armor. Well, we've been hearing from Luxembourg today, chapter and verse from different foreign ministers about how they see the situation from a general perspective vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and then opining, some of them at least publicly, about what they think has happened in Russia over the last few days. And so Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, pretty clear, saying that she believes that this shows that there are massive cracks in Russian propaganda. And let's be clear, she has been condemning of almost everything that Russia has done since the start of what the Russians call their special military operation, what everybody else calls the war in Ukraine. And the other thing to point out is that there has been some material assistance that the EU is providing today, being announced that a further a, the ceiling on money that can be provided to Ukraine has been increased by a third, up to more than 12 billion euros available to the Ukrainian government from the EU perspective. That's the sort of thing that's being talked about today, at least publicly.
All right, Dominic Kane reporting from Berlin. Thank you very much, Dominic. Now, as we mentioned earlier, we are getting the first indication from the Russian foreign minister that Wagner is here to stay in Mali and in the Central African Republic, where they've been active. Let's talk to Nicholas Hack in Senegal's capital, Dakar. Nick, who are those comments by Sergei Lavrov aimed at? Who is he trying to reassure when he says Wagner will continue what he's doing in Mali and CAR? Well, it's here. Cyril, he's trying to reassure those governments that have contracts with the Wagner Group, notably Mali, the Central African Republic. There's also Mozambique, Libya, Sudan. There's a dozens of them that have uh, military contracts and deals with the Wagner Group. But he's also trying to reassure the 3,000 Russian citizens and fighters that work for the Wagner Group that are on the ground and that haven't heard up until now from their leader, Prigozhin. So... Those are the two people, those are the two groups of people, but also uh, the leader of the Wagner Group himself. Because in this public statement, he's also trying to reassure that Wagner's interest in Africa, which is quite important, will continue to go on and will continue to benefit the group. It still is a, a for-profit organization. So the fighters, the Prigozhin himself, as well as the African governments that rely on the Wagner Group for their security. Those are the people that uh, uh, the, the, this comment is addressed to. Yeah, how so reliant it, are they, Nick, on Wagner, these countries? Well, if you talk about Central African Republic, their reliance is extremely heavy on the Wagner Group. Essentially, the Wagner fighters are not there just to fight off armed groups that are active. There are about 14 armed groups active in the Central African Republic, but they also provide private security to President Twaitera himself. Uh, in Mali, same thing. The, the Wagner fighters are on the front line in Mopti, fighting off armed groups linked to al-Qaeda and, and, the, and the local affiliate to ISIL. And what's interesting, the timing of Lavrov's comment is quite interesting because in Mali, there is the biggest and most expensive UN operation, uh, MINUSMA. And the Malian junta has called on that peacekeeping operation to end. Much of that uh, is down to the fact that they can, they say, rely on their Russian partnership to go on. But what was interesting to see during the last few days, on Saturday, at the beginning of the rebellion, Prigozhin, uh, in his address in the Telegram, mentioned Africa. He said, I quote, we were told that we were needed in Africa, and he's uh, referring to the Kremlin. But we were abandoned, and all the money and support that was supposed to be given to us was stolen. He felt that he was at it alone. But what's clear here is that Wagner needs the support of Russia, but the Kremlin needs Wagner in order to continue to exert its influence on the numerous countries in the region. Zin? Nicholas Hack reporting from Dakar, Senegal. Thank you very much. Now, the office of Belarusian president uh, of the Belarusian president says it is unsure if uh, Evgeny Prigozhin is in Belarus. We'll see whether that actually changes in light of the latest statements uh, by Evgeny Prigozhin that were just uh, released. Um, now, we're going to be able to Let's listen. I'm being told that we now are able to bring you audio from the Wagner's chief, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Listen to this. As a result of intrigue, Wagner was bound to cease to exist on July the 1st. The decision was made at the worst possible moment. Despite us showing no aggression, we were hit by a rocket strike and then by helicopters. Around 30 fighters were killed, some were wounded. This triggered the decision to move out immediately. The goal of the march was to prevent the eradication of Wagner, ensuring those who made a huge amount of mistakes during the special military operation because of their incompetence be held accountable. All right, before I go to our next guest, I want to bring you up to speed on the sequence of events, how things unfolded since Friday. Well, on Friday, Prigozhin blamed Defense Minister Shoigu for attacking Wagner camps. And he started with what he, he undertook, what he called a march for justice with 25,000 fighters. Overnight, his troops marched into Russia's Rostov-on-Don, then to Voronezh. Prigozhin says Russian troops let them through without a fight. 
Then Vladimir Putin addresses the nation and calls those taking part in the mutiny traitors and threatens to punish them. Just hours later, Prigozhin turns his fighters around, saying that he wants to avoid spilling Russian blood. The Kremlin says Prigozhin will go to Belarus while his fighters will go back to Ukraine. Viktor Olevich joins us now from Moscow. He's a political analyst and the lead expert at the think tank, the Center for Actual Politics. Viktor, we laid out the timeline there. Now we're in uncharted territory. We just got the audio from Prigozhin. I don't know how much of it you were able to listen to. What do you make of it? Well, it's definitely a very dangerous situation where uh, units uh, under uh, different command structures were involved in uh, fighting. As you mentioned, there was an airplane shot down, a military plane. There were several helicopters shot down. There were uh, army, the Russian army conducted uh, an airstrike on a Russian highway while the Wagner, uh, a Wagner military column was passing. Uh, these are tragic and very concerning events. And uh, even though a, uh, at, at this point, the situation has, at least temporarily, has been resolved, uh, it's uh, not uh, completely uh, clear if this is uh, the end of this crisis or if this or similar crisis may uh, spill over uh, in the coming uh, months. And it's important to note that uh, it's a dangerous, it's a possibly dangerous situation, not just for Russia. It's also a potentially dangerous situation for the West. Mm -hmm. It's a potentially dangerous situation for other, uh, for Russia's other neighbors. In the last, since the beginning of the 20th century, Russia has undergone violent change several times. In 1917, two revolutions that brought down the Russian Empire, and uh, a civil war ensued for several years. But at that time, nuclear weapons did not exist. Obviously, Russia was not a nuclear power and could not present a challenge like that to, to its neighbors or to other states. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and it was the primary nuclear power in the world. But the Soviet collapse, the Soviet Union's collapse was controlled. And it happened in dialogue with the West. And in fact, the United States sponsored the removal of nuclear weapons from Ukraine, from Belarus, and from Kazakhstan to Russia, effectively to ensure their safety and uh, a single uh, command and control structure over them. But at this point, we are seeing that the very events that may be making some in the West happy or glad, these very events may also be presenting a grave danger for the West. So it's a question, and it's an important question to raise. Is pushing Russia too far? Is isolating Russia too much? Is sanctioning Russia too heavily? Can, can those measures bring Russia to a, an, such an unstable situation? That the, threat, that the West would face a threat of an entirely different magnitude. Victor, I'm going to jump because in. Because at this and, point, and we, and your point is the well, West may like or dislike. Victor, I'd like, to, I'd like to jump in because there are a few things that have just happened very recently that we'd like to address. Um, before, though, you just said this raises the question of how the West should be handling this. And do they want a Putin-controlled Russia? I'm paraphrasing here. Do they want a Putin-controlled Russia or would they risk going somewhere into the unknown. But this was an internal feud. You bring up the West. This was between Putin and in a, a relatively unsanctioned military chief within Russia. Well, we understand very well that this situation would not have happened if, first, if the special military operation would not have been initiated. And secondly, if uh, the pressure on Russia and internal pressure did not create circumstances for it. You see, there are almost no liberals or pro-Western elements left in the government. Uh, there are no liberal elements left in Russia that could uh, take over from Putin if something would uh, happen to the current powers that be. So. 
it's important for the West to consider the possibility that if Western pressure at some point destabilizes Putin's government, that any type of regime or any type of government that comes to replace him mm. or to challenge the current authorities okay, may Victor. be much more anti-Western and may be much more dangerous. And in fact... Mm -hmm. Victor, that point is well taken, and, and we hear you on that. But before so I let you go, I actually do need you to address the information that we just got moments ago, which is Yevgeny Prigozhin releasing his first uh, statement, for lack of a better word, audio, uh, since all of this transpired. And I want to bring you, I don't know if you were able to hear it, so I'd like to bring you some of the headlines from what Yevgeny Prigozhin said. He said, all we wanted to do was to hold accountable those who made mistakes. And the reason Wagner turned on uh, Russia's military leadership, again, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, was because they were aggressive towards us, not the other way around. We did not, I repeat, we did not march to overthrow the military leadership. Those are the last lines that we got from Evgeny Prigozhin. Your reaction to that? Well, of course, uh, any leader of a mutiny uh, or a uh, revolution always has justifications for their actions. And, of course, uh, it's uh, quite logical that uh, the head of Wagner would blame uh, Russia's military leadership, uh, who he has been in conflict with for months, uh, f for what happened. But the very events when, uh, when a key southern city in Russia, Rostov-on-Don, has had been taken over by a private military company, when the uh, staff headquarters of Russia's southern military district in Rostov-on-Don had been taken over by the Wagner Group, and when Wagner Group uh, mercenaries and fighters had been moving uh, towards Moscow through several of Russia's regions, of course, whatever, the, whatever justifications are stated by Prigozhin, it's obvious that this created a, an internally a dangerous situation. Right. When there is inter international fighting, when there is fighting between different military groups within one country, it's a very dangerous situation. All right, Viktor Olevich, a political analyst and lead Especially expert at the think tank, the Center uh, nuclear for Actual Army. Politics. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you so much for joining us on the program.